<laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna break tradition on Easter. You know, last Easter I didn't <laughs> preach on the resurrection. This Easter I'm not preaching on the resurrection either. Um, but uh, I'll preach on something a bit closer to the resurrection. I'm going to be preaching on the Lord's Supper. Now, I've preached on this topic before, but there's a lot of um, us who weren't here uh, last time I preached on this topic last Easter. So I thought I'd preach on it again, just because on Easter Sunday, like I said, I do like to have a dinner on Easter Sunday, and especially that Sunday, because every time we get together as a church uh, for dinner, we break bread. But I especially like to make sure we do it on Easter just because that's the time we remember the death, burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll just read from 1 Corinthians 11, um, which is probably one of the key passages when it comes to uh, breaking of bread. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's read here in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, from verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, this morning, I just wanted to give you like my position on what most people would call the Lord's Supper or communion or the Lord's Table. Um, I personally like to, you know, I still am in the habit of calling it the Lord's Supper, so you'll probably hear me say, call it the Lord's Supper. Just had a habit of growing up, you know, you know, in my Christian life. But I actually prefer to refer to the ordinance as breaking of bread because I believe the Lord's Supper and the breaking of bread are actually two different things. And I'll show you that in the Bible today. So, so why do I call it breaking of bread and not the Lord's Supper? Well, you, did you know that the Lord's Supper is actually only mentioned one time in the Bible? It's the passage that we just read. It's kind of like people refer to Sundays as the Lord's Day. But that's mentioned one time in the Bible in Revelation 1, I believe. Um, and, you know, that's just become the name of Sunday. But then th we don't know whether John was writing that on Sunday or whether he's talking about the day of the Lord. Um, it's just the phrase that ha has stuck with Christians to refer to the day that they go to church. And it's the same with the Lord's Supper. It's just the, the name that's stuck referring to the ordinance of the cup and the bread. So it's mentioned here in verse 20. So see, when you come, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And I'll explain this verse in a moment. Now, the reason why I refer to it as the breaking of bread and not the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's Supper was actually a meal that they came together to eat. Now, in most churches, when you have what's commonly known as the Lord's Supper, you're not actually having a meal. I mean, you're having a little bit of bread and you're having a little bit of juice. So it's, it's not a meal, but uh, when we see here, when they came together um, to eat the Lord's Supper, I mean, people were getting drunk. It's obviously there's a lot of drink. Um, and, and they're eating together uh, a meal. It's not just that ordinance of the little piece of bread 
and the drink. So that's why I call it the breaking of bread, because the breaking of bread is something that they did during the Lord's Supper. Like they'd have the Lord's Supper, they would eat together, and then they would break bread to remember uh, the broken body, body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what was the Lord's Supper? Well, if we see here, when it talks about in verse 17, Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, for the worse. So obviously they were not doing this the right way. He says here in verse 18, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Now, the Lord's Supper, first and foremost, was a meal that they ate together in unity, undivided, right? So, when you see the word divisions here, it doesn't just mean that there were disagreements amongst them in, amongst them in the church, because no church is free from disagreements, right? Even in this uh, church here, uh, there's probably disagreements in what we believe on different things. So, whilst we strive for perfect unity in doctrine, what we can do, though, is have unity, meaning we, can, we know what disagreements and differences to put aside. We still have unity in one goal, and unity meaning that we're actually together. Because I believe when it's talking about the divisions here in the church, it's not just that people were disagreeing with one another, but they were disagreeing on things to the point where they were actually separating from each other and not fellowshipping with one another. Even though they would come together into the one place, they would not eat together. And I, I think we see an example of this in Galatians 2, where we see the example of Peter and Paul rebuking Peter for separating from the Gentiles. Look at what it says here. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we see there an example of what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11, that there were heresies in the church of work salvation, people saying that you need to be circumcised to be saved, and people were separating from one another to the point where even Peter and Barnabas were carried away with it, and they were not wanting to eat with the Gentiles. So they were not eating the Lord's Supper, right? Because they were divided rather than eating a meal together in unity. Now the other thing there is, it says here, when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for because in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So what was happening here? That people were coming together for the Lord's Supper, but because they were hungry, they would not wait for the others to arrive and they would eat and they wouldn't have enough food and there were people that were wanting, people that maybe were less fortunate would come and have no food, they would be hungry. And he's saying, you know, if you're hungry, why don't you eat at home? You know, rather than coming to, to the house of God and then eating before others and one is hungry and another drunken and, and coming together unto condemnation. So not only were people sometimes coming together and then not eating together, but then they would come and not wait for each other and not eat together. So you see here that the Lord's Supper is a meal that they ate together, whether it was they came at the same time and actually ate physically together, or they waited for one another so that they could eat together. And he's saying here that if you can't wait, if you're hungry, then eat at home first so that you uh, don't shame uh, them that have not and despise the church of God. Now, let's just go here to... Verse 20. Now, with that in mind, this is how we need to understand verse 20. Because some people teach that the Lord's Supper is not for the church at large to enjoy together. That they would say, you know, split off and have it in your houses. And there's a, there's a certain line of reasoning that they use, which I don't believe is correct. 
Um, and one of the, the reasonings that they have is a, a misinterpretation, I believe, of verse 20 when it says here, when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So they'll take that verse and they'll say, see, when we come together as a church into one place, the purpose is not to eat the Lord's Supper. That's why to break bread and drink of the cup as a church is not right. And people that do it on a Sunday, it's not the right thing to do. What you should be doing is, you know, families should be inviting families over and having meals within the houses. And then that's when you break bread together because you don't want to come together to condemnation eating the Lord's Supper uh, when you're not meant to. But see, in the context of what's said around that, you know, it talks about the, the divisions that are among them, the heresies. Um, then it says, when ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, there's a second way that you can read that. You can say that when the Corinthians were coming together, they weren't eating the Lord's Supper because they weren't waiting for one another. They were separating from each other. So this is not the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper is something that you actually eat together. So whilst they can say they're coming together to eat the Lord's Supper, Paul is admonishing them saying, no, when you come together, you're not eating the Lord's Supper. Right? This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Why? Verse 21. For, so because in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So you can see there that he's saying, you're not eating the Lord's Supper because you're not waiting for one another and there are divisions. Now, I think this is supported by the fact, because if you see from verse 21 onwards, that's now talking about the ordinance, uh, sorry, from verse uh, uh, 23 onwards, it's, it's talking about the ordinance of the breaking of bread and the, and, and the cup and going back to what Jesus did. Now, if you skip over that whole uh, passage there, which is just talking about that ordinance and how we are to examine ourselves, he concludes at verse 33 and verse 34 saying, Wherefore, so because of all these things I've talked about, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. So what was the issue he brought up in verse 20 and 21? They weren't waiting for one another. So he concludes at the end saying, Therefore, when ye come together, wait for each other. Because that was the problem. That's why you weren't eating the Lord's Supper together, because you weren't together. And in verse 33, he clarifies that saying, when you come together to eat, wait for one another, tarry one for another. Now, I had somebody tell me um, that this coming together, because, you know, when they believe that uh, the Lord's Supper is not for the whole church and it's just for individual little groups, they would have to believe that this coming together in verse 33 is referring to a different coming together that's that's talked about in the verses preceding. Because you can see the same words are used further up. Verse 20, uh, sorry, 18. For, for verse 4, when you come together in the church. Right, so there's that coming together. And then it says here in verse 20, when you come together therefore into one place. Now we go to verse 33, again it says, when you come together. Now somebody that believes that you can only have the Lord's Supper in individual houses, they say that, well, this is not talking about the coming together into one place or coming together in the church, right? This is just a coming together. So you would somehow have to reason in your mind that even though the passage is proceeding, which this is referring to, he's saying when you come together in the church, when you come together into one place, you're not eating the Lord's Supper because you're not waiting for one another. Then he says here in verse 33, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now, to me, I would reasonably assume that this is talking about the same coming together because there's one coming together previously that they're not waiting for each other. And he's saying, now come together and wait for one another. But somebody that believes that the Lord's Supper should be done separately in individual houses, they're saying that the first coming together, you're not waiting for each other and you're not eating the Lord's Supper. But when you come together in the individual houses, wait for one another. Now, that could make sense unless you include verse 34. Because verse 34 says, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order. So why then, if it's coming together is meeting in your homes, that he says, well, if you're hungry, eat at home. But aren't you already at home? And, and if you're going to have like a non-public gathering, like if, you're gonna, like if I'm just going to invite like one or two families over, why would I invite them over for dinner and then not wait for them to eat? Like, do you know, does that make sense? Like I invite Michael over, I invite Ozzy over with his family, and then... I invite them over and then I'm hungry so that I, I don't wait for them. I'm just eating without them. But then it says, but if I'm hungry, let them eat at home. So I'm already home though. So it, to me, it just doesn't make sense unless it's referring to the other people 
but I think it just requires a bit of um, twisting and reason, uh, you know, unreasonableness to, to fit that interpretation into this passage rather than accepting that verse 20 is saying, no, the, the Corinthians coming together were not waiting, they were dividing, and therefore they were not eating the Lord's Supper. And this is why Paul is rebuking them. And then he concludes saying, hey, when you come together, wait for each other so that you actually are eating the Lord's Supper together. So that's my explanation of that passage. And I'll go into a couple of other things um, as we go on. Now, the reason why breaking of bread and um, uh, the Lord's Supper, I believe, are different things. Remember, because the Lord's Supper is a meal that they ate together. Um, The breaking of bread was what Jesus did when he ate the supper with his disciples. Remember, he, he stood up and he broke bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Now... One thing you might not have noticed, because I thought maybe, well, if the Lord's Supper and the breaking of bread are the same, maybe the breaking of bread was to commence the Lord's Supper. It was, you know, you, you, got, you got together, you were about to eat, and like we say grace, it might be like you get together, now you, you take the bread, you divide it amongst each other, you divide the drink, and then you eat together. Now, that was a thought that I had, but this is not how Jesus practiced the Lord's Supper. And I'll just show you these verses here. Because just, just look, I'll read these verses to you and, and just notice what you see. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Mark 14, 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And uh, Luke 24. says here, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. So what do you notice here? So in three of the Gospels, Jesus Christ, he's actually already eating. You know, the, the, in, second Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11, you see he took the cup after he had supped, saying, this is the cup of my blood, oh, this is the blood of the New Testament. Oh, I can't even remember exactly what it says. But basically, after he supped. So it was, they sat down for a meal, they were eating, and then as they were eating, he took bread and broke. So it was something that he did during the meal. It wasn't to commence the meal. It was like something separate that he did. And it makes it a point that they were already eating when they broke bread and drank of the cup. Now in 1 Corinthians 10, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against necessarily people calling it communion. You know, I'll just read these passages here. But it says here in 1 Corinthians 10, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are are all partakers of that one bread. (coughs) Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Michael, do you mind just getting me a cup of water? Um... What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, thank you, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Now, I just wanted to read that larger uh, passage of Scripture because I wanted to show you the context. is about eating, right? It's about eating a meal. Um, he's saying, if any man bids you to a feast and you be disposed to go, and it's offered in sacrifice to idols. Like, this is the context of which this is talking about. And I think that makes sense in light of the Lord's Supper being a meal,
Because he's saying, you know, you, you can't partake of the Lord's table. You can't have the Lord's supper when you're eating meat that's sacrificed to idols and you're eating the cup, you're eating, you're drinking of the cup of devils and you're eating the, the bread of devils and the table of devils. Um, so again, I think the communion here, obviously communion just referring to fellowship. But I believe that communion here in the Lord's table is talking about them actually sharing the meal rather than the ordinance of the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup that was passed down from the Lord at the Last Supper. Now let's go to Luke 22. I didn't go into this much depth when I preached it last Easter Sunday night. Now some people believe that the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover and and I think this is this is totally untrue. Um, you know, we we don't keep the Sabbaths anymore. You know, we don't keep the carnal ordinances. The Bible says, "Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day of the Sabbaths and the new moons." And the Passover is a holy day. It was one of those holy days. You know, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, all these different feasts mentioned in the Old Testament. These have all been done away and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So the Lord's Supper is not a New Testament continuation of the Passover. I, I believe you know this, this sort of teaching comes from um, this sort of teaching comes I believe just from you know the Catholic mentality where they have this you know the priesthood version of the New Testament version of the priesthood version you know like baptism is circumcision and then the, the communion is a continuation of the Passover. And this is one passage um, that they'll go to in Luke 22, 15. And he said unto them, so this is uh, Jesus when he asked his disciples to go and prepare for the Passover. You know, and he says to go to the master of the house and the guest chamber and say, where shall I eat my Passover? And then they, they have this upper room furnished, which is a miracle in and of itself, right? I mean, imagine being the disciples and saying, where are we going to prepare for the pa Passover? And Jesus says, I'll go to this, this house and ask him, where shall I eat the Passover with my disciples? And, and then he just knows about it. Right? And there's a, there's a room ready for them to go and eat. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so anyways, he says here in verse 15, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I, su before I suffer. And, 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 I'll, and I'll interpret this verse in the sense that the Passover is the meal, is the Last Supper. So the Last Supper that Jesus was eating with his disciples was the Passover because he was saying, With great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover. Now, one way you could take that is, well, are they actually eating the Passover at the Last Supper? Or is Jesus just saying that he wanted to eat the he wanted to eat this Passover with them before he suffered, but because he suffered, he didn't get to eat that Passover with them. Now the reason why I don't think that Last Supper was the Passover is because Jesus was the Passover Lamb. Now he fulfilled the Passover, didn't he? And what happened on the Passover? The Lamb was slain, and that was one thing that was miraculous about the timing of Jesus' death is that he died at even when the Passover lamb was killed. Now, you can't eat the Passover before the Passover lamb is killed, right? I mean, you, you kill the lamb and then you roast it with fire and then you eat the Passover with unleavened bread. But Jesus fulfilled the Passover by dying at the same time that the Passover lamb was killed. Now, that's one of those amazing things. Mean, did they not realize? You kind of think, you know, Jesus is on the cross dying. They're preparing the Passover and then at even when everyone is killing the Passover, Jesus dies on the cross. So I, that's, that's what I believe happened. I, I, I'm still studying it out, but I think, you know, even when we watch that account in Mark, you know, the third hour they crucified him, at the sixth hour he said, Eli, 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 lama sabachthani, and at the ninth hour, uh, or was it the ninth hour? At the ninth hour he cried, Eli, Eli. Oh, six, at the sixth hour, there was darkness over the face of the whole, the whole earth. The ninth hour, he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then it says, he cried and gave up the ghost. Now, did he, does that mean he died immediately after the ninth hour? Or did possibly three hours pass, and then it became the even on the 14th day of the month, and that's when he died, to fulfill the Passover. Um, that's what I believe. So, if he died to fulfill the Passover, how did he eat the Passover with the disciples? So, that's why I believe what he's saying here is, because he knows he's not going to eat the Passover with them 
he, he desired greatly to eat the Passover with them before he suffered, but because he has to suffer and die on the cross, he didn't get to eat that Passover. Um, and, and one thing that's interesting, you know, like after he dies, and, and I can't prove this, but just a thought, that there's no mention of the disciples still celebrating the Passover. Because, I mean, if it was such a big event, you would think, you know, after he died on the cross, you know, um, and possibly that day was a Sabbath of rest, you know, they would then go and celebrate the Passover, right? They would go and, and, and kill their lamb and partake of the Passover. But there's no mention of them doing that. Like, you know, they went and got the spices and they buried him and did all these things. And I wonder whether they just maybe got caught up in, in everything that was happening on that, on, on that day and, and, and didn't get it. Because obviously a lot of things would have been happening. You know, Jesus dying on the cross. And maybe they didn't get around to doing it. And in a sense, fulfilling the fact that because Jesus Christ died, they no longer needed to keep the Passover because he had died. And like uh, 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 Ephesians says, that he, all those ordinances he nailed to the cross with him, putting an end to them. So that, that's interesting that there's no mention of the disciples still keeping the Passover that night that Jesus died on the cross. Um, now let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. So I don't believe Jesus is saying there that he's desiring to eat the Passover, then they ate the Passover because he was the Passover lamb. He died when the Passover lamb was killed. Therefore, he could not eat of the Passover and therefore eat the Passover with his disciples. So I believe my current position right now is that the Last Supper happened on the day before the, the Passover. So they were preparing for the Passover. They were eating the Last Supper. He broke bread and then that even... He was taken, you know, uh, and then, um, and then um, everything happened. Um, okay, uh, let's go on. So 1 Corinthians 5. And I'm not 100% sure of the timeline. I know I, ha I haven't pieced it together myself yet, but it's something that you might want to do in your own time if you have time is, is to look at the, the last couple of nights of Jesus' ministry and try and piece them together, mm -hmm. piece together the resurrection and see um, how the events actually took place. Now, this is 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, let's read here. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So I'm just reading from here to give you some context where he's talking about fornication in the church and this fornication being put away from among them. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are leavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So this passage here is sometimes alluded to, because some people will say in verse 8, you see there, it says, therefore, let us keep the feast. So they'll say, see, that's why the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover, because we are exhorted to keep the Passover. It's saying, hey, keep the feast. But they're, they're missing, I mean, we read this, you would have seen what it's talking about. Isn't it obvious that it's not talking about keeping a physical feast? It's talking about the spiritual feast being kept. It says here, you know, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. So we are the unleavened bread that is eaten with the Passover lamb. And then he says, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And if that's unclear, he continues in verse 8, making sure that we know that this feast that we're keeping is spiritual. Because he says, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven. And look at this, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So you see how there the Passover is being kept by us because Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb and us, we ought to be the unleavened bread kept unleavened with sincerity and truth rather than the leavened bread of malice and wickedness. So 
Think about this. If, if the Passover is a continuation, if the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover in the New Testament, but yet we get rid of the lamb because now the lamb is spiritual, why are we having a spiritual lamb but a physical bread? Doesn't it make sense that it was a physical lamb and physical bread and now it's a spiritual lamb and spiritual bread? It's no longer a physical meal. So I don't believe that the Passover, um, that, the, that the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover. I believe that the continuation of the Passover in the New Testament is the bread, of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth and the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. And the Lord's Supper is something totally different. It, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the Passover. And they were eating a, a Lord, the supper before the Passover and breaking bread and taking of the cup. So because the Lord's Supper is not the Passover, therefore we don't look to the Passover to see how we practice the Lord's Supper. Because they're, they're, they're two totally different things. So some people will look at the Passover and say, well, you know, the lamb was, is, uh, is... They'll say that the Passover, you know, they had the lamb and then several families to share the lamb. And then they would come together and eat and they would eat in their separate houses. They didn't celebrate the Passover as a whole congregation. But let's just go there to Exodus 12. I forgot to go there before. And just read that passage about the Passover. So he says here, let's just read from verse 3. Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So I think if they were consistent, with saying, well, the Passover was done in houses, therefore the Lord's Supper should be done in houses. Well, then therefore, you know, I mean, think about it. They're saying here that the only reason why you invite another family is because your family is too small to eat that lamb. Otherwise, it's pretty much just your family eating that lamb. But nobody would celebrate the Lord's Supper that way. Nobody would just celebrate the Lord's Supper just with their family and say, well, I've just got enough food for my family. You know, they would get more food so they could invite more people and have it together. Whereas this idea is because you have to kill one lamb, then rather than wasting, I guess, the lamb, right? Then if, if your family is too small, then you would have one other family to share that lamb so that uh, as much of it, of it is eaten as possible. Now, I won't turn there, but, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 is mentioned in... Um, I'll turn to one of the passages. Let's go to uh, Matthew 14, 19. Now, whilst I don't believe this is specifically the Lord's Supper... Um, it's interesting here that when Jesus feeds the 5,000, it uses that same terminology. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Now, I don't particularly believe this is the Lord's Supper. The, the point I'm just trying to make here is that the, the Passover lamb, it was like a limited amount of food, right? And there was a certain amount of food and you'd invite people to come and share this food as much as there was food. And when Jesus feeds the 5,000, he breaks bread and, and blesses it, and it, it's just a multiplicity of food. Like it's just, he can feed whoever's there. And I believe that it's a picture like of the Lord's Supper because we all partake of that one bread. There's enough to go around. So because you know, everyone, everyone takes of that bread and, and um, that's why the church does not have a limited size. So it's different in the sense that, you know, there's a limited amount of people in the Passover sharing um, the Passover. But I think when it comes to the Lord's Supper, I think it's everybody. Um, I'll show you a couple of other verses to do with that. But Acts 20, verse 6, because if the Lord's Supper is a limited amount of people, it says here in verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue, continued his speech until midnight. Now, when it says here that the disciples came together to break bread, do you think it was just like a, 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 a limited number of them? Or is it saying when the disciples came together to break bread that all the disciples were there? So it doesn't just include the apostles. So I don't know whether you can make a case that the Lord's Supper is celebrated in limited amounts of people because all the disciples here are coming together to break bread. The other thing, if you were to take the practice of the Passover uh, and apply it to the Lord's Supper, 
then why don't we only do the Lord's Supper once every year? You know, and some people will. They'll say, well, therefore, the Lord's Supper should only be practiced once every year because the Passover was only practiced once every year and it should be done on the Passover. Now, a few problems with that is already I show you, I don't believe that the Last Supper was practiced on the Passover day, which is because Jesus died on the Passover day. So that wasn't celebrated on the Passover. So that's, that's one point. Um, another point is, I'll show you a couple of other verses, but Acts 2. It says here, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now just think for me for a second. Now that verse, it's saying they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Did they only do that once a year? They didn't, right? They didn't just have fellowship once a year. They didn't just pray once a year. So why would they only break bread once a year? So, you know, maybe you could say that. You know, they, they just continued breaking bread. They were doing it once every year and they did all these other things. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that, were, all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man, man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, could you read that verse and think that they only broke bread once a year? No, I mean, they're breaking bread from house to house. I mean, you don't say I'm doing something house to house when you're doing it once every year, like in a different house. So obviously, the disciples are breaking bread more frequently than once a year. They are not following the pattern of the Passover. I think it's because they recognize that it's not the Passover. Um, so it's not practiced once a year. Um, so somebody might ask the question, so how often should we break bread? Uh, now, I don't think that there is an answer to that question. You know, I think you could probably make the case maybe that every time you have the Lord's Supper, every time you eat together, um, that uh, you break bread. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know necessarily whether you have to hold to that rule. I mean, we don't know whether there are times where they ate together and they did not break bread. But you might ask the question, well, why do we only break bread several times a year? Well. You know, I, I don't really have a reason. It is a preference, I think, of how many times you do it per year. I guess I don't want it to become too repetitive that it loses its meaning. But at the same time, because it's... The, the reason why I only do it at dinners is because that's when Jesus did it. He had a... It was the last supper. It wasn't the last lunch, was it? So that's why we don't break bread at lunch. We break bread when we have dinner together. So I'm just following that, uh, that example. Um, that's my own conviction. But... Somebody might say, well, don't we have dinner every Sunday after soul winning? But see, that's a closed dinner. That's, that's dinner for people that go soul winning. That's not the whole church invited. But tonight, everyone's invited. So this is a dinner that we're going to have as a church. And then we're going to break bread. All right, now let's go to John 6. And hopefully I can keep you guys' attention. But... Um, Two other things I just want to cover. Now, what is the significance of breaking of bread? Now, the breaking of bread, it's, it's an ordinance. It's not a sacrament. So what do I mean by that is an ordinance is a practice that symbolizes something else. It's not a sacrament, which is something that you do to receive grace or something that makes you more acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Um, we go to John 6, and this is where Jesus talks about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And this is obviously a passage which is hotly disputed amongst Catholics because they believe in transubstantiation, which is when the bread and the cup is blessed and broken, it actually turns into the physical flesh and physical blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't believe this because in John 6, it says here, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? So they're saying this is hard because Jesus has just told them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. When in verse 61, Jesus says, Doth this offend you? Verse 62, What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now you can't detach this from the fact that Jesus just said in the previous passages, that Jesus said to eat of his flesh, and then he says, the flesh profiteth nothing. Because remember he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood, otherwise you have no life in you. But then he says here that it is the spirit that quickeneth, and quickeneth means makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit 
and they are life. So how do we have the life that Jesus is talking about? Well, we believe on his word. We have his word abiding in us, not actually eating his flesh and his blood. And um, Alex brought up a good point in his sermon, which I'll share with you again today. But in Matthew 28, uh, 26 verse 28, where Jesus is actually breaking the bread and drinking of the cup, he says here, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he had already blessed, he had already broken, he took of the cup, saying, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But then when he refers to the drink that's actually in the cup, he says, But I say unto you, I will not drink for drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. Now, if it turned into his blood, why wouldn't he say, I will not drink henceforth of this blood until I drink it anew with you in my, in my Father's kingdom? No, because it was still wine. It was symbolic. Uh, so the question might be asked is, you know, does the bread and wine, when you break bread and drink of the cup, need to be unleavened? Now, I think this is a preference. I don't think it's wrong if somebody uses unleavened bread because I don't think you can prove from the Bible that they used unleavened bread. Now, I think it can be a preference because of what it represents. So, so you know, me personally, I, I would say, you know, I would use unleavened bread just because it signifies the broken body, which is sinless, and unleavened wine. And, you know, I would be a bit cautious to use leavened wine because I know probably people in here believe it's a sin to drink alcohol and I don't want to put a stumbling block in front of my brother. So, you know, if it's not a sin to use unleavened wine, I'm just going to use unleavened wine and, and, and avoid that issue. But, you know, I don't know whether that's a conviction you need to have. Obviously, drinking alcohol is a totally another topic. But I don't know whether you can prove that they always used unleavened bread. Now, remember, if they ate the Last Supper before the Passover, they weren't eating leavened bread yet. So that meal could have been done with leavened bread. And the bread that he was breaking was leavened bread because they weren't, they weren't, uh, it wasn't the Passover yet and it wasn't the Feast of Unleavened Bread yet. But look here as well. Um, I wanted to show you here in, uh, was it Acts 20? Verse 6. Look at this. I already read verse 7, but I didn't read it to you verse 6 on purpose. But it says here, verse 6, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. So he makes it a point here that they, they sailed away from Philippi and the Feast of Unleavened Bread had already passed. They're not eating unleavened bread anymore for these seven days. And then it says in verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, if we believe that this breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper, then they, they're not breaking bread with unleavened bread. I mean, you could assume that they still used unleavened bread, but why does it make it a point to say that the days of unleavened bread had already passed? Um, that's something to think about there. Now, so that's one thing. The significance of the breaking of bread is it's symbolic, right? It, sim it symbolizes spiritually partaking of Christ's flesh and spiritually partaking of his blood, not physically. Because when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we do take partake of his blood and, and partake of his flesh. And we have that life. We're quickened. But we do that ordinance so that it is symbolic and people can see um, and be reminded of that truth. Now we go to Luke 24, verse 30. Just going to different passages. Uh, 24, verse 30. This is after Jesus has rose again from the dead. So they're walking along and they meet this person and they're, they're talking to him. And he sits down and has meat with them. And it says, And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, talking about Jesus, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. You remember in 1 Corinthians 11, and in all the other passages, he says, do this in remembrance of me. So this is one reason why. Obviously, it symbolizes the spiritual partaking of his, of his flesh and his blood, but it also brings to remembrance those that partake of the bread and the cup to remember what Jesus Christ has done for him. And we see here that this actually happened to the disciples after he rose again. He broke bread with them and then their eyes were opened and they remember and it, they, he was made known unto them in the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. And the last thing we see... We go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, was it verse 17? 
in verse 26, he says here, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So one, remember, it symbolizes the, the bread, the, the body and the blood. It reminds us of what Jesus Christ did for us. And lastly, it sh it's a public testimony of people that see the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup to remind them of the Lord's death. Um, <clears throat> and we often see that in the Bible where things are done so that people will look at them, like in Joshua when they put up the stones and, and they ask, you know, your children in time to come will ask, what mean you by these stones? And that's one reason why the Lord instituted ordinances. He instituted the breaking of the bread and he instituted baptism because our children one day will grow up and ask, what mean ye by this ordinance? What mean ye by the breaking of the bread? And then we can explain to them what it means. Now, if you can just bear with me for a bit longer, I wanted to just lastly just cover um, who should partake of the Lord's Supper because I believe that there's a lot of wrong doctrine out there, a lot of wrong teaching that gives people the wrong frame of mind when they partake of the Lord's Supper. And I particularly wanted to touch on this today because if you are joining us tonight for dinner, I want you to have that right frame of mind when we break bread and drink of the cup together. Now, the first point is, you know, who should participate? At, at this church, we participate, we, we, we practice what's called a, a, what would be known as an open communion. Now, the reason why it's called an open communion because you don't have to be like a, a, an official member of this church to partake of the bread and the cup with us like in some churches like if you uh, are not baptized in that church or you're not on some official list they don't welcome you to partake of the bread and the cup together now to me that's a bit silly because you're part of a church when you're physically there i mean if somebody's there week after week after week but they're not on the list and you say they're not actually part of the church because we have a closed communion that's kind of silly because they're there i mean you're part of a church when you're part of that church you know, being, having your name on a list doesn't like automatically now make you part of that church. So this idea of a, of a members list and who can uh, partake of the bread and the cup, I believe is unscriptural. So whilst we practice what would be known as an open communion, in reality, every communion, every breaking of bread is a closed communion because you can't partake of that communion unless you're physically there. You know, so it's a, it's a closed communion. So whilst people will call it an open communion because we allow anyone that is saved and here to partake of the bread and the cup, in, in, in essence, it's, it's a closed communion because you have to be here and be part of this church to, um, to partake. So, you know, you may be, you might have your name on a list in, in another organization somewhere, but if you're here tonight with us breaking bread, tonight you're part of this church. So that's, Open versus closed communion. Now, one thing that is really emphasized when we partake of the bread and the cup, he says here, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now this part in the Lord's Supper and in the breaking of bread is rightly emphasized because it's saying here that if you don't partake worthily, you're, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. So anyone that is not warned of this passage and then just lackadaisically takes it, not thinking about what it means, can in effect eat and drink damnation to himself. Now, what's disputed is what does unworthily mean? Because most churches will teach you that to, to partake unworthily, it's about your works and it's about the sin in your life. And then they'll say, you know, if you have unconfessed sin in your life, if you have some uh, sin in your life that you're struggling with, or if you are not right with a brother or a sister, um, you should not partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, I don't believe this is the case because if works made you worthy to partake of the breaking of the bread, who is worthy? You know, it's like if works got you saved, who's saved? So if works make you worthy, I'm not, who's worthy, right? Because we've all got sin. None of us keep the commandments perfectly. And often, you know, they're just reading that meaning into it because we're, we're disputing what does worthy mean, right? 
So I don't believe you can be worthy by your works, otherwise who is worthy? And the whole idea of being right with your brother, that's not talking about partaking of the bread and cup. That verse, if you go to it, is actually talking about giving an offering, right? It's saying like, if you, if you bring your sacrifice to the altar and you have something wrong with your brother, go and make it right first and then come and give your offering. Saying God would rather you, rather than receive something from you, like you're trying to give God something, God wants you to go get right first. You know, to obey is better than sacrifice. So this is not talking about the Lord's Supper where we're not coming to give something to the Lord. We're coming to commune with the Lord. We're coming to come into his presence and fellowship with the Lord. So number one, you know, baptism does not make you worthy. Baptism doesn't make anybody worthy of anything. You just get wet. So when people say you need to be baptized in order to partake of the Lord's Supper, generally it's because they believe baptism adds you to a church. And then because you're not part of the church, you can't partake of the Lord's Supper. So you need to be baptized to be added to the church, then be part of the church to partake of the Lord's Supper. I mean, if you're an open communion, then it doesn't really matter. But some people still uh, put that requirement on people, even though, is that a requirement? It says worthy. What does it mean to be worthy? Well, baptism doesn't make you worthy. Baptism can be examined by others because somebody can say, wait a second, you're not baptized. You shouldn't partake of the Lord's Supper, right? If baptism is a condition in order to take of the Lord's Supper. It doesn't add you to the church. And you know, some churches delay baptism. So it's not even on the part of the person that they can't partake of the bread and the cup because they have to sit some 25 week class in order to get baptized. And then now they can't, you know, if they're uh, partaking of the bread and the cup weekly or monthly. Now they just can't partake of it for 25 weeks, not because it's through fault of their own, but because they have to sit through this class and the church and the elders are delaying their baptism. The first church I went to, you had to sit a 16 week basic Bible knowledge class before you could even get baptized. Once you, and, and they didn't even baptize by immersion, they sprinkled you. Uh, and, and once you got baptized, in order to get baptized, you had to agree to submit to the elders of the church. You had to agree to all the doctrines. And then only once you were baptized, you could partake of the bread and the cup. And almost it was like in that church that people, that's what they were striving for. They were going, they were going to, 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 to these classes and the commitment week after week to go to these classes so that they could get baptized. And, and we always made a big deal of it. Like the Sunday they got baptized, if that was a Sunday where we broke bread, it was like, ah, like now you can break bread and you can take of the cup. Because before, every other time, they just had to let it pass. Yeah. You know, it was like such a big deal, like that first week that they could, they could take of that bread and not feel condemned by the congregation. Um, so, you know, baptism can be, can be um, exam examined by others, but your works can be examined by others also. Because if you remember here, it says here in verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So if you have, if you have sin in your life, I mean, obviously, can, people can see whether you're in and out of church and, and, and people that know you might know the sort of sins that you struggle with. And we know ourselves. We know that we have sins. So who doesn't have sin in their life? Another thing as well, look at what Jesus says here. He says, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this do in remembrance of me. Look at the cup. This do as off as you drink it in remembrance of me. So now if your works made you worthy and about and when you went to break the bread and drink the cup, you're thinking, oh, I've got to get right with God. My sins, am I worthy? What's the focus of the Lord's Supper for you? It's you, isn't it? But what's meant to be the focus of the Lord's Supper and of the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup? Jesus. So Jesus is saying you break the bread and drink the cup to remember him, not to remember you. So this is another reason why I don't believe it's about your works. Um, because the focus is the Lord Jesus, not in about how you are living your life. Now, I would, I would say this though, obviously there is a slight focus because you need to make sure that you're saved, obviously, because I believe, and we'll get to this last point here um, in a moment. So I believe that the, the primary focus of the breaking of bread and drinking of the cup is the, the Lord Jesus Christ, not in your contrition and in how sinful you've been. Now, another reason why I think your works being a measure of how worthy you are is number one, if people are honest with themselves, like I said, they're not, they're not going to feel worthy by their works. Because if you're honest, we all have sin, we're not worthy. And what, does, what effect does that have for the Lord's Supper? Well, it pushes people away 
from the Lord's table. Because how many people have you seen when they break bread in church, and I don't believe they're practicing it the right, the right way, but when they have that ordinance during the service, there are people that are saved that won't take the bread. And it's not because they're not saved that they don't take of the bread, which is the right reason I think you should not take of the bread, but it's just because they don't feel right with the Lord. And, and you think, well, this is a time where people should come to the Lord. You know, if they, have, if they have been away from the Lord, they've got sin in their life that they feel that they don't have fellowship with the Lord, when you break bread and you drink of the cup, that should be the time where God is welcoming you back and saying, hey, come back and have communion with me, have fellowship with me. It's my body and my blood which washes you clean and have communion. And that should compel them to want to get right, not the other way around. So I think with that frame of mind, it pushes people away from communion with God rather than bringing them to it. Now, another thing is, if we read here, it says here, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Now, when you see them breaking bread here, does it sound like a sad occasion or does it sound like a happy occasion? It's a happy occasion because they're remembering what Jesus Christ did for them. But how often in churches when you break bread, it's a somber occasion because they say, well, now we're going to reflect on how sinful we are. Let's confess our sins. It's a sad thing. Yes, it was a sad thing when they broke bread at the Last Supper because Jesus was about to go and die. But when we see them practicing the breaking of the bread, they're, they're doing it in singleness and gladness of heart. They're praising God because they're remembering what Jesus Christ did for them and the fact they know now that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. So I don't believe it's a time of sorrow and contrition. It's a time of joy and gladness where we reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for us. So that brings me to my last point. So what makes you worthy? It's not baptism. It's not your works. What, what's the only thing that can make you worthy? It's faith. Faith makes you worthy. Just like faith is what saves you. It's not by works lest any man should boast. So we are made worthy to partake of the bread and the cup by faith. That's why it says, judge yourself. Examine yourself because you're the only one that can examine your own salvation. And that is something that somebody should reflect on when they partake of the bread and the cup is, are they saved? You know, and, and that's the only reason they, they should protect. Now, if you know you're saved, you're not examining that anymore. You already have examined it. You know that you're saved and you're partaking of the bread and the cup. So it's not something you ought to be examining every time you break bread and drink the cup. If it is, then you, maybe you've got to think about your doctrine on how you're saved and, and how you are, are, are quickened by the Spirit. So verse 28 says, you know, let a man examine himself. Another reason why I think it's just talking about faith is because it says here in verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So they don't know why they are drinking of the bread and the cup. And somebody that's not saved probably doesn't know why they're taking of the bread and the cup. They're probably taking it as a sacrament. Or, like in this verse says, maybe, maybe they're just coming along for the free feed. Right? People are not discerning the Lord's body. They're not thinking, why are we coming together? Why are we breaking the bread of the cup? It's because they're just coming and just eating the food because they're hungry. Um, like Jesus said in John 6, you know, don't labor for the meat that perisheth. Labor for that which is eternal. So unbelievers should not partake of the bread and the cup. So that's a legitimate reason to let the bread and the cup pass because if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, there's actually a stern warning in the Bible saying, if you eat and drink unworthily, worthily, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. Even to the point where God was killing people because he says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. That means many were dead because they were abusing the Lord's Supper. So um, this is something that we should really take seriously especially for people that are unbelievers, if they're just in a church and just taking it willy-nilly, not discerning the Lord's body, they can get into a lot of trouble with the Lord. Now, the last thing I just want to say is, because a question came up, is, well, if only unbelievers can partake unworthily, how could a believer ever partake unworthily? So they might say, well, why would a believer ever examine himself to partake unworthily? 
Now, obviously, as an unbeliever, you'll never partake by faith because you're not even saved. But as a believer, you can still partake unworthily by not partaking by faith. Because even though we're believers, we're saved, you can still do things not by faith. Remember when Kevin preached, from faith to faith, you believe to be saved, but you still walk by faith. You can still do things not by faith. And you can still partake of the bread and the cup not by faith. Now let me give you a couple of examples of how a believer cannot partake of the bread and the cup um, by faith. Well, number one is, you, you know, not every Catholic is saved. Not every Catholic is unsaved. But some Catholics, when they partake of the bread and the cup, they don't partake of it by faith because they're partaking of it as a sacrament. They're, they're thinking that this, this practice is what gives them additional uh, 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 grace, what makes them more acceptable to the Lord, as opposing to realizing by faith they're accepted by the Lord. And this is just a remembrance of that by faith. So that is one way a, be a believer, a saved believer, can do something the wrong way. They're, they're doing it because they're thinking, this is what's making me worthy, as opposed to, I am worthy by faith, and then partaking it. One, an another way that believers can partake of the bread and the cup unworthily, uh, and not by faith, is what it says here in uh, verse 29. They're not discerning the Lord's body. So maybe they are, like I said before. They're just coming along and just eating of the food, and taking of the bread and the cup, and not thinking about what it represents. And I'm not saying that, who knows who does this, but obviously people were doing this in the Corinthian church. He's saying you come together and you're not discerning the Lord's body and, and you're being judged by it. And that's why, you know, believers can also not partake of faith, by faith, I believe, and they can be chastised of the Lord. Where as an unbeliever is condemned of the Lord, it says here in verse 32, but when we are judged, judged we are chastised of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So if a believer does not partake by faith, you can, be, you can come under the chastisement of the Lord. So three ways there. As a sacrament, as something that you think is making you more holy. Uh, number two, you're not considering what it means. You're not discerning the Lord's body. And number three, you're just coming along to eat the food. You're just coming along to eat the bread, um, just to, to fill your belly and to serve yourself rather than thinking about the Lord and it reminding you of the Lord. And this is why God, I believe, was chastising the believers in Corinth and also condemning maybe unbelievers that were drinking and eating unworthily. So uh, I, I appreciate your attention. I hope that gives you a bit of um, why I practice it the way we do in this church and um, what we believe about the Lord's Supper and the breaking of bread. And hopefully you can join us tonight. Um, for dinner on Easter Sunday and break bread with us and, and, and we can put these principles into practice. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for uh, this church. Thank you, Lord, for your word that we can glean over the, tr um, the truths and learn from it. Um, pray, Lord, that we would always do things scripturally. Um, thank you, Lord, that through your broken body and shed blood, we can gather together as a church and we thank you and ask that you continue to use this body of believers to preach the gospel, to um, live righteous, Lord, to, to have an effect on uh, this world and on this country. And we thank you, Lord, that we can now uh, eat together as a church and pray that you bless the meal and bless, bless the preparation and the fellowship. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.